Hey, all. Hey, everybody. Welcome back in. JT here on behalf of the ETH Finance community on Reddit. Back for another ETH Finance EV Mavericks happy hour for this day, March 29, 2024. Give us a thumbs up, smash a bell if you haven't already. We have Ram Aluwalia from Lumina Wealth with us. Hello, sir. Good to see you. Hey, JT. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having me. Uh, we are. Uh, I'm super delighted to have you. I can't wait to jump into this. Uh, but first, we're going to do our show opener. The uh, Weekly Dudes live stream is all about showcasing the best of the week from the eFinance community on Reddit. This is a read-along reaction series, and if you want to follow along, head to dailydudes.com, designed and produced by our very own Hani Abu. And while you're at it, go grab today's PO app. It's now available for checkout on Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, and b b b b base Big thanks to Tricky Troll for capturing and curating each day's dudes and the A word for curating this, this beloved weekly list. This podcast is available uh, on Libsyn, Spotify, and Pods.media after the show. Give us a few hours. We'll have this episode ready to mint on optimism. Thanks to Pods.media. Find us there at Pods.media forward slash EV Mavericks. If you're watching this stream on Discord, uh, be sure to mute the window that I'm streaming here on Discord. That'll help cut down on any echoes. As always, if you know someone who wants a piece of this action, send them my way. We're going to go right into the opening tidbits, or we're going to go, sorry, we're going to go to our rich list first. Let me switch windows here. Our rich list at number 10, it ethical trade at 68, scientist at 72, Hani Abu at 72, 696 ETH. At 77, set one less at 78, Crypto well Currency at 91, Tricky Troll at 92, Benito 2030 climbing up to 111, and Logri the Bard at 114, and the Almighty Everlasting Super Fizz himself at 176. Upcoming guests include April 5th, Don Gosen of Nevermind, and April 12th, Paul Brody, our good friend and fellow EV Maverick, the blockchain lead for Ernst & Young, and now the president of the EEA. So congrats to Paul. April 19th, we have Swagtimus Prime, longtime OG EV Mavericks uh, holder from Scroll. Here goes our morning trinity, Fat So Piggy, user Fat So Piggy cries out Ethereum, user 2 pay. Two City clocks in a price at thirty five hundred and seventy dollars. In user two peg two city comes in hot with the ratio. Bago Gel twelve has uh, listed five hundred and sixty one days since the merge and uses pink video is at eighty nine thousand seven hundred and seventy hodlers subscribed. We are up for thanks so much for everybody that is uh, joining into our awesome Discord today. And uh, we got a great, great, great guest, and I can't wait to get started. So let's get right into it. Rom, uh, we're so honored that you are able to uh, join us today. And uh, we, I found you on Twitter amid uh, the uh, Gemini debacle and the EARN program uh, failing after FTX. So I can't wait to get into that. I'm going to read just a few things about you that I stole from your page, um, which is a Lumita, was it Lumita Wealth? Yeah, Lumita.com. So Ron built his career in banking and capital markets, started investing in alternative assets after the 2008 crisis, and saw the power of investing in niche and overlooked strategies. Rom's investment experience covers hedge funds, private equity, credit, and digital assets. Rom was a pre-IPO investor in various startups, including Lyft, Lending Club, and Digital Ocean. His research on mispriced assets, such as the Grayscale Widowmaker trade on Bloomberg's Odd Lots podcast, the Grayscale trade has gone on to be one of the best non-consensus investments in 2023. He built Peer IQ, a leading platform for managing credit risk, and exited the business to Cross River Bank, the, uh, the leading a16z backed fintech bank his research and writing has been featured in the wall street journal the economist cnbc american banker and more ladies and gentlemen rom thank you for dropping by today i want to know a bit about lumina wealth let's let's talk let's just open that band-aid up first and uh where where are you guys headed with lumina wealth what's the most exciting angle of your of your platform 
Sure. So first off, thanks for having me. I wish my mom was here to hear that. That was a great intro. I know who wrote that. My uh, mom's but... watching. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is a mother's name? Yeah, I know. So, uh, Lumen is a private wealth management firm. So, you know, I spent 12 years at, at Merrill and I look at the wealth management industry and said, this is broken. There's too many conflicts. 60, 40 is dead. We recognize that now with a high inflation rate environment where bonds do not provide diversification. I said, there's got to be a better way. And that was really the genesis of Lumina Wealth. So it's like, how do you do cross asset class investing? Uh, and what cross asset class investing means is looking for uh, diversification across themes that we have conviction and are excited about. You know, that includes digital assets. It includes a nuclear renaissance play, semiconductors, growth and private credit. So themes that we believe have, you know, a 10 year plus story uh, and aren't trafficked in by legacy institutions because that's what creates the opportunity so we're excited about a, a number of themes obviously digital assets is is one of them we were all over semiconductors uh last year uh as a way to express a view on on ai uh we have invested in distressed commercial real estate uh and uh yeah you know we're looking at themes in elderly care you know the fastest growing demographic yeah. cohort yeah is the oldest of the oldest fun facts not the 18 to 34 it's the oldest of the oldest so services that cater to that population we think will do quite well so we're thematic investors first and, and foremost fantastic hey wolf parking your hot miking can you mute please thank you um so let's let's uh since we are basically like a you know ethereum focused crypto asset focused uh group um I want to see, like, in that specific asset class, how it started versus how it's going. Uh, maybe in terms of U.S. regulations, the upcoming ETF, broadly speaking, when you started looking at the, you know, back in 2008 at emerging asset classes, what you thought about Bitcoin then and Ethereum then, how has that shifted over the years to the present day? And, and do you see... Uh, the U.S. being a leader or a follower moving forward? So in 2008, you had the banking system on the rocks. I was at uh, Merrill Lynch. I lived literally on Wall Street, two blocks from the New York Fed, which is on Maiden Lane. And we had these subprime securitizations that almost took down the banking system. And also the lack of trust in counterparties. Banks were not willing to finance each other overnight that's called the repo market mm. that created a lot of issues uh of course bitcoin started to uh rise over the following years and ethereum um a few years later and i looked at that and i said gee this technology could have addressed the issues from the banking crisis because one you have transparency in the loans you could put these assets on chain and get loan level transparency and two you don't have a trust requirement on your counterparty you don't have to trust if Lehman Brothers can make good on their credit default swap on AIG, let's say, right? Right. That they're facing with. You can just say, hey, here are the assets. They're on chain. Even now with the banking system, we had a, a mini crisis last March of last year uh, because people didn't know what the quality of the holdings and balance sheet for some of these banks were and the access to liquidity. You know, all of that should be on chain. So it's a very clear problem statement that we have that exists in markets today, not just banks, but other markets, capital markets, uh, and blockchains and digital assets present a solution. And it seems to me that's a natural course of where we're going. And now you've got Larry Fink leading from the front on this at BlockRock. And of course he championed the Bitcoin ETF, the Ethereum ETF, he's also championing and advancing the thesis around tokenization. So yeah, the promise is, is in the future and uh, it's exciting. It's gonna, it's not a, you know, it's not an easy path to walk. <laughs> it takes a lot of policy advocacy, mm. it takes elections, uh, it takes broadening the tent, it takes putting use case to that real world value. Uh, it takes putting the bad guys in jail and we're making good progress on that too. <laughs> Speaking of uh, bad guys in jail, SBF, as you know, got sentenced to 25 years. Um, what? 
I think he's going to have good behavior in that 25 and maybe sounds like maybe get out earlier. I don't know if you can shed some light on it. Do you think that was a fair sentencing for a bad actor or somebody as prolific as of a bad actor as he was? No, no. I mean, there've been comparisons made to people at 40 years mm. uh, or for less, lesser offenses. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. It's a tragedy. Yeah. We don't know the number of people's lives that were taken out of that whole thing. I mean, there was a lot of relationships destroyed, trauma inflicted, businesses destroyed. Right. There were some crypto hedge funds that were fully trapped that lost value there. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, yeah. It's it it traumatic for the industry. Now it also accelerated a bottom, which is interesting. That along with it did. Right. It did accelerate a bottom, uh, which was uh, created a good opportunity. But the main thing to get crypto adoption more broadly is you need good policy. You need good policy, right? So the current policy is hostile to crypto. We have an SEC chair that's intransigent who, after uh, approving the Bitcoin ETF, for some reason, decided to have a, a missive around this Bitcoin ETF acting like a merit regulator. That's not the behavior you expect to see. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, these regulators were nominated, we believe, uh, I think it's well appreciated now by Senator Elizabeth Warren, you know, uh, in a deal with the Biden administration. So, you know, you, uh, you need new regulators in place. That's one. Two, you need an act of Congress because regulators have to obey the law. Uh, and so, you know, Congress needs to step up and take action. And there's a lot on their plate. They got to get stable coin regulation out there. Uh, but the US is behind Europe, which has the Mika framework. We're behind Singapore, which is leading in tokenization. They have exchanges that are premised on tokenization. They're testing with BlackRock right now. Uh, Singapore is making a bid for the future of what markets look like. <laughs> Larry Fink recognizes that and he's an American. He's, he's a patriot. He wants the US to vector in the right direction. It Japan is already leading on this front, right? So. We're, I, we'll get there slowly in fits and starts with wins and losses along, along the way. You know, uh, there's good policy advocacy groups like Fair Shake. They're making an impact. Uh, you know, we're writing op-eds. I wrote an op-ed with former SEC chair Arthur Levitt uh, criticizing SEC chair Gensler. Mm. Like chair versus chair action was great. We did that in October of, of uh, 22, in the middle, you know, right near the bottom of the bear. And we wrote another op-ed in American Banker. I'm going to write another one in a few months around tokenization as well, uh, linking that to what that means for creators. Think about Hollywood. Think about music and the Taylor Swifts of the world. There's a thousand other talented Taylor Swifts on TikTok and Instagram that can't break through because there's a finite number of stars that a studio can promote and mm. put on the roadshow. Just how the industry works. Uh, and you can use decentralized technology to disintermediate that. You can let the creator have a direct engagement with their fan base. And the fan base can, one, underwrite the creator based on their taste and interest. Uh, two, they can finance the creator. Uh, and in exchange, you get proceeds and royalties from that. And three, they can promote the creator. It's an incredible opportunity. Remember that, uh, that video that went viral last year? It was like, uh, rich guys north of Richmond, right? Uh, that views, seven million views. This guy declined to get a deal from a studio. He had a, a YouTube video, this like folksy country. Tour. Oh, okay. And he went to direct to direct to consumer. Yeah, and it was it was all via YouTube. And imagine if that was all managed via smart contracts. And imagine now. He can't tour because he's not a studio, but imagine if he could raise funds through smart contracts, for example. Right. David Bowie bonds. David Bowie bonds. Right. Were the first, you know, intellectual property that was securitized, represent where the assets were the revenue proceeds of uh, David Bowie's licensing on his, uh, you know, all his music. So, like an '80s, an '80s pop icon tokenizing was not on my bingo <laughs> card, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, all that's securitized now. You know, Marvel Comics, when I was at Merrill in 07, uh, we had Merrill uh, securitized Marvel's intellectual property. This is before all the movies came out. 
you know, Iron Man, all the rest, the Hulk, Avengers. And so the investors in that get to benefit from all those royalty streams. Mm -hmm. Individual investors don't, by the way, because you can't access that. There's no ETF. You can't go to Schwab and buy a bond. You know, so that deprives the investing public of diversification and really interesting investment opportunities that you can only access if you are a large, sophisticated investor. You know, all of this uh, kind of heavy handed policy making or, or lack of it, it kind of tells me that the bank, you know, going back again to the disruption that's going on, I think they're trying to protect the bleed a bit. They're, you know, the traditional institutions are, they know, they see, they want to make sure they get to frame the narrative before, you know, private investors get to rug pull, you know, tradfi in a way. Uh, I don't I don't even know if that's even close to being on the mark, but it's going back again to your, your music example. What if just common everyday ordinary things, you know, like, uh, you know, folk art or uh, anything that people produce out of their own home? You know, if you could do a direct consumer model that gets around distribution lanes, you know, it starts to disrupt the it, it puts everything in a shipping container rather than on a store shelf like at Walmart or something. I don't know. That way people can buy and, and trade and do whatever they like, you know, as long as they're not, you know, violating, you know, obvious health codes or something like that. But um, I want to I want to go back to the how we met. I sent a DM to you on Twitter because you were unraveling the Gemini Earn uh, lawsuit and yep. you know, the DCG thing. And you've been really good about, first of all, I'm streaming your Twitter feed. If people aren't following you, they need to follow you. Twitter, Twitter, I'm sorry, x.com, twitter.com forward slash Ram Alawalia. Because what I admire about your Twitter feed is you don't just, you're not just a crypto native, right? You'll pick like a nice, to uh, to a hot topic of many different kinds, uh, whether it be regulatory, you know, world government related, uh, financial or crypto. And you'll do a nice little thread that kind of over does an overview of what's going on. And uh, I really liked how you, when the court cases were coming down, because uh, Jim and I would put out like a notice on Fridays or Tuesdays or whatever it was every other week about the update. And then you would kind of unravel the legal speak of it in plain words. Yeah. And so were you, if, I mean, that we've, we've now been given notice that it looks like we're going to be getting one-to-one -one up to 97% of the assets back. And I'm bringing this up because yeah. there's a lot of Mavericks that had money in earn as you, as yeah. you can probably assume. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Were, was this outcome a shock to you? No, it wasn't. I mean, I remember back in uh, January and February, you know, what I was saying on Twitter and a couple of spaces is, you know, you should expect a good recovery and then the probability that increased over time. And what I was trying to do is encourage people, encourage people not to sell to a third party, like a hedge fund that's going to buy the claim at discount. Mm. Right. Um, so uh yeah no I'm, I'm glad we shared that research we had uh spaces on twitter especially in the january february march period there's a lot of uncertainty a lot of moving parts and we're looking at the the terms are being floated between genesis and gemini and yeah ultimately the conclusion we had was that there's sufficient collateral to make customers hold and the collateral value is increasing <laughs> right so you know uh, now, you know, here we are and you know, Ethereum's done well, Bitcoin's done well. So, yeah. Uh, and they had GBTC collateral, which helped improve recoveries. That's a key thing that we saw in the balance sheet. Has, uh, uh, has Barry Silbert entered the realm of being like a super villain out of all this? Yeah, of course. Of course he's entered that. I mean, I think he, I think New York magazine might've even used that description for him, right? Oh, really? I think, a, <laughs> I think they did or it's on Twitter, but yeah, he's, uh. It's like persona non grata in crypto. Do you think really he'll fun. be? Do you think he'll be uh, hanging on Mount Golgotha next to SBF at some point? 
I think it's a good good question. I think that he broke civil and criminal laws, is my opinion. I'm not stating that as a fact. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but I believe, in my opinion, that he committed fraud. We were. I was also the first on Twitter to say that DCG is the next Enron. And then six months later, the NYAG, the New York Attorney General, did in fact file a civil complaint oh, against damn. DCG. So uh, if you read that complaint, you know, it looks indeed like fraud. Now, uh, you've got the SEC also taking action. All that uh, helps recoveries. Uh, but uh, I haven't seen a criminal complaint against Barry hmm. yet. Well, maybe that will still happen. We I, shall see. I want to uh, I want to make sure that uh, we get some of our questions in. That uh, before we get to some of the user questions, I want to let you know a, a little bit about this community in particular. So the ETH Finance subreddit. If you if you have an article you want to share, you want you've got a publication, you have a, a video, we welcome you to drop it into the daily thread. It's at the top. It's a it just a, revolves every day. It's a noon daily thread. A lot of the people that are in ETH Finance, it's an it, it's got like eighty thousand, ninety thousand members somewhere in there. A lot of us are very antiquated with each, uh, acquainted with each other over the years. Some of, some of us since Genesis uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem, but we do appreciate broad macro takes as well. Feel free to use that platform as a sounding board for your publications. You 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 just make use of that daily, because uh, what generally happens is. Uh, folks that take advantage of that opportunity often get really constructive feedback because our membership group is 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 a uh, not all of us are basement dwelling Cheeto finger M Mountain Dew drinking degens. A lot of us, I mean, we've got teachers, engineers, computer scientists, core developers. Like every yeah. now and then, we have core devs coming into the daily. It's a real like. Paul Brody, uh, bl blockchain lead for EY, uses the daily from time to time to share ideas about what he's doing over at EY. It's just, it's a nice, small, noise-free community with heavy moderation. We don't put up with a lot of shit. It's not a spam room for token drops. I mean, it's it gets noisy when there's price action, but generally speaking, it is just a wonderful, wonderful room to add to your catalog. That's great. I dropped in there this morning. I, I had I had been a member anonymously, but I created a new account and joined with my official ID. Hey, <laughs> well, let's pivot to a couple of questions from some of our members. Uh, Bob Rossi is actually, uh, he's sitting in the Discord chat right now. Uh, I'm just going to pull out a couple of questions from him. Yeah. What What is Rom seeing in his circles for the reason that ETH is still being the definitive second option against BTC instead instead of a one A and one B type of asset? So, in terms of the ETH approvals, or uh, I think he's just or... yeah. I think it has to do it. It, it says. He says, I'll point the question very specifically to the context of BTC getting an ETF before ETH. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So the number one reason Bitcoin was first in line, I'd say, is one, it's, uh, you know, it's the largest uh, market cap asset in digital assets. It's mm. got the most history. Uh, it's been declared a commodity by the CFTC and the SECs never consider it not a commodity. It wasn't so, even a discussion whether it was, okay. Never even a discussion, right? Right. So for all those reasons, it made sense that the Bitcoin ETF would go out first and then an Ethereum ETF. So we'll see, you know, I, I don't know that, I don't think Gensler will approve an ETF this May. Not necessarily bad, by the way. It means you have more time to accumulate Ethereum at a better price. Mm -hmm. It'll happen eventually. It might mm -hmm. happen next year with a new administration or a new SEC chair. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the parties that are submitting applications will litigate just like they did. Grayscale litigated the SEC to get the Bitcoin ETF approved. What's your so under? Nobody, what's your under over on uh, the May deadline for the ETF right. spot? Maybe five percent. It won't get approved. I would say. 
95 percent it will not get approved not approve of that i've I've got a fifty dollar bet with a friend of mine, and then I had another friend put a fifty dollar bet on poly trades for me uh, <laughs> that it would get yeah, approved. <laughs> the part of that is I I'm relying on the analysis of James Safer and Eric Balkunis, who did a great job at Bloomberg. They're looking at the correspondence from the SEC and the issuers, and leading up to the launch of the Bitcoin ETF, there was correspondence. You know, the clarifications or questions that come in for meetings is. This and that and that's not happening it's a dead silent so the the tinfoil pundits on youtube are like aha but there's silence because it's a copy paste there's nothing to talk about no, right now no there's always <laughs> there's always something there's always about. talking Somebody, right so the application some of them have staking some don't uh th there's so many nuances and details you have to get right and it's a new asset class so I take silence as a low probability. And look, uh, there's a political component too. Remember, Gensler had a very unusual letter that he paired with the approval of the Bitcoin ETF. He hasn't done that with any other asset. Mm. Uh, and, you know, his uh, nominator, Elizabeth Warren, doesn't want, you know, she's got a campaign called Anti Crypto Army. Think about that for a second. That's crazy, isn't it? Right. It is crazy. I mean, yeah, that, that, yeah. that that's even legally able to be that's pinned, right. you know. Right. Uh, so would you say anti-gold army? Would you say anti-software army? Gosh, it's nuts. Uh, so yeah. Bob, Bob Rossi continues, when does ROM see the U.S. government getting to a point where a comprehensive yeah. regulatory framework for blockchain technology is established? You need an act of Congress. That's what you need. And you need multiple acts of Congress. The first will be around stable coins. I think Chair Patrick McHenry, who's going to retire, who leads the House Financial Services Committee, wants to get that win before he leaves. That'll be the first. Uh, but you need you need an act of Congress. So it's not going to be this year. You need elections. Uh, you also uh, that's to get a comprehensive framework, which is a very high standard that Bob was asking there. There are lesser standards than that. So if you get good regulators in the seats, that doesn't require an act of Congress. It does require a change in administration, though, or certainly... Look, I think Gensler's out regardless who gets elected next year, by the way. I've been joking he's going to be out, but then he's going to be promoted to... <laughs> I don't think he'll be promoted to Treasury Secretary. I think that was his angle some time ago. I don't think that'll happen now. He has created a lot of kind of ill will around, around, not just in crypto, by the way, just many, many aspects of the markets. It's it's really quite remarkable how how polarizing he's been. Yeah. But if you had a, let's say you had Larry Fink as treasury secretary, that would be a home run <laughs> in the next administration. No one's floated that except me. I'm trying to get that out there. We gotta get let's there. do it. It's on the calendar right now. Rom said right. on March 29th, he wants Larry. <laughs> Larry Fink would be like the guy, he's accomplished a lot. He built an extraordinary business called BlackRock, got trillions in AUM. He's an incredible voice for crypto. He understands tokenization. He's the world respects him. You know, you know, he, he's the second Satoshi Nakamoto, if you want to think about him that way. I mean, he's like a living, breathing guy that can advance. Yeah. The spirit and thesis and ethos of crypto, you know, it's a yeah. get in this treasury secretary, you know, and he would appoint the secretary, the treasury plays an important role in identifying policy, mm. by the way, and they seek to ensure harmony across the regulators, like the CFTC and the SEC and the, and the bank regulators too. So you got to get that role is the crucial role. So regardless who you're voting for, what you want to focus on is who will fill the seat of the secretary of the treasury? They are the think tank for the United States economic policy apparatus. It's a, it, it, it would be something to behold if that, if that were to come true. I just, uh, uh, yeah. Each election cycle, I look less and less forward to. to I don't be... think it's, it's not on the cards right now. Like, I think Trump has someone else in mind who worked at Goldman Sachs. Uh, but he's obviously been leaning more and more into crypto, especially with 
the offering of NFTs, <laughs> which he's ready to get a lot of money from, right? So he's kind of flipped on crypto uh, in a meaningful way. And, uh, you know, the current administration, I think they have to reassess after this election their approach to crypto. I think they might be realizing that too, because some of the people that were the biggest attractors, like there was a guy in the White House who wrote a very critical paper in crypto that came from somewhere out of the Gamma Quadrant. You know, he's gone. He's no longer there. That's good. Uh, but, you know, we could see that Brian Brooks, who is the former chief legal officer of Coinbase, he was the acting head of the OCC. With OCC is the national bank regulator, the most significant bank regulator in the land. Hmm. He was in the Trump administration, right? That was a home run for crypto because you got Anchorage, which was the first national bank to be approved to engage in crypto. And once that door opens up, it's hard to close the door because by the way, I crossed river. So I ran the crypto business there. My clients included business of like Coinbase. And, you know, we, we provided fiat ramps, uh, money in, money out movement. So if you ACH and wire into Coinbase was passing through cross river bank, you'll see it oh. in the, in the wire transfer information anyway. So the point there though, is that when I spoke to the FDIC, I could petition the FDIC and say, look, Anchorage is offering these services. You got to have a level playing field. Therefore we should be able to offer these services too. Yeah. It's like pulling a, it's pulling the pod paid doors open for a bunch of companies. Just rule of law. Yeah. It's rule of law. You, you know, you cannot be mm -hmm. the precedent prejudicial against a party, you know, they've got to hold everyone to high standards, which are defined in regulation and law, uh, that they can reject on that basis. They can also slow play things, which is a lot of what's happening right now. They can just make it difficult to get stuff done. Yeah. The guard, the guardrails of, uh, bleed as I referred to earlier, right. uh, Caitlin long comes to mind. Uh, didn't oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm watching that story with keen interest. I think the Federal Reserve regrets the way they handled that situation. Yeah. Uh, but you said you're on Wall Street. Uh, you have to understand my humble beginnings. Um, but I did get invited to the EY blockchain conference in New York City. I stayed at the on 8 Stone Street at the Double Tree. I was like, the I hate Stone Street. On Stone Street, I live. You know, Wall Street was like two blocks from Stone yeah. Street. Yeah, right? yeah. I stayed in the Double yeah, Tree yeah, for an event, awesome. and, and I got to I got to uh, meet Caitlin Long with uh, Paul Brody. I was, I, uh, it was a real honor. You know, He's a great champion of human freedom. Yeah, fantastic. We actually incorporated a Dow LLC in the state of Wyoming uh, for our ETH, ETH Finance has something called HodlerCon which is a Dow LLC and they, they take a trip together every two years. And this year they're going to Thailand. So because of the framework, you know, the laws of the state of Wyoming, make it as such, it, it, you can form an, a, an LLC with a Dow and all that there. It's kind of, kind of fun using the money Legos as intended, you know, when, yeah. it, when this in, well, we're in it for the tech. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think with Caitlin, it's now becoming clear for those that follow this closely that her application for a FedMaster account was denied for political reasons or they, they didn't like something about what Caitlin was seeking to build as opposed to, yep. uh, you know, rule of law. So, yep. uh, Picking winners and, and losers. Uh, Right. And now this is going through the court system and the courts apply this, the law. And it's an Amer it's an incredible part of the American Republic that we have three branches of government to create checks and balances. And, uh, I, I hope that Caitlin is successful. I do. I do too. Uh, she, she's really a joy to listen to. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm just glad I had a chance to meet her. Um, I'm going to go to another user question. Yeah, dude, 11. That's our usernames are hilarious around here. As CEO of Lumit of Wealth, how do you approach educating clients about the opportunities and risks 
associated with investing in cryptocurrencies, especially considering the uncertainty and misinformation about preconceived notions around the space? Great question. So many of our clients actually are very knowledgeable about crypto. In fact, our largest client rated his wealth in the Ethereum ICO and was buying for years, a billion plus net worth. And he knows crypto deeply. Most of our clients know crypto pretty well. Not all of them, though. So the ones that don't, they have an interest in crypto. They understand the majors, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so forth. They also understand the risk. They don't necessarily know the best way to approach it. And that takes some education uh, around info, information security and securing your private keys and all the rest. But I'd say we've attracted a very uh, discerning and smart client base. You know, we've grown through social media and referral, plus our investors who are venture backed firm. So we have a pretty good group around the hoop, I would say. <laughs> you know, it's not a. Right. Yeah, you know, we have a pretty good group. We're we're very lucky to have our client base because they're also we learn from them too. You know, they've created wealth in different areas. Uh, one's a multi generational lumber family, who, by the way, is looking to work with a Bitcoin miner to dry their wood pellets because the heat from the Bitcoin mining can be used to evaporate the moisture from a wood pellet. Oh my gosh, you gotta love the it. Commodity I mean, it's so funny, right? It's right. Interact. <laughs> I would, I would never have guessed. That. I learned more about wood pellet than I ever thought I would. <laughs> so yeah, no, we haven't had, we haven't, we we attract a forward-thinking audience for sure, absolutely, uh, and entrepreneurs and founders and GPs of venture funds and private equity funds. They're a very sophisticated group. So we actually have not had to focus too much on like the basic education right we had to educate on different strategies yeah uh, or why we might like a certain investment approach or token or this or that and eigenlayer and a few things here and there but you know we're very lucky to have a, a great client base so your your role for them with these high, the high net worth folks is that you're 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 um you're basically reinforcing and providing like, you know, rails that make sense for them to continue their path and their journey. It's va it's validating the things that they're I, interested in and you give a validation and, and a bit of a sanity to it. A lot more, I would say. We, it, we really are leading the client. So, because in, investing is hard, it takes a lot of skill. Right. And you want to have exposure to multiple asset classes. Because diversification does work, but you don't want to kill your returns with diversification by owning things like bonds. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to own secular long-term themes that you believe in that will have continued growth and that you can invest against. You want the trend to be in your favor. So, you know, we have clients that may have had concentrated positions in Bitcoin and Ethereum, and now they're saying, hey, I want to diversify my staking yield, or when the cycle turns, I want to rotate out. Help me do that. Yeah, I don't know what to invest in. And by the way, uh, I have a daughter, and I don't have a trust will and estate set up. Hmm. Uh, and I need to think through my tax situation. I have an IRS audit. How do I handle all this? Right. So we provide wealth, holistic wealth management. So we sit down with the client, and we understand what are their objectives, what's their risk tolerance. Uh, are they, is it aggressive? Is it conservative? Right? What liquidity needs they have? When do they want to retire? And then we work backwards to build an asset allocation. That asset allocation will span different categories, including public equities, including private credit, which mm -hmm. is very conservative, but you can still get a double digit return. It will include venture capital with firms that we believe are the best in the world at what they do it'll include uh digital assets not alameda research <laughs> no no we have one venture firm we like right now we're very very picky we're very picky so uh we try to find the best expression of any possible theme and be selective right so um 
yeah so that that you know we you know then we meet with the client monthly quarterly walk them through the progress and help build their trust and estate plan and then for clients of significant wealth like 50 million plus 100 million plus in wealth we'll build out their family office for them so this means setting up potentially a private trust company in wyoming with a trustee maybe an offshore trust there's a lot there's a lot of i mean i could talk to you about trust in the states like an hour a whole different topic. there's a lot there's a lot there there. there's a lot there there's a lot there so it's full listed we're a fiduciary we're not a broker dealer so we're aligned with our clients by law we have a duty of care and that's not how traditional wealth management works traditional wealth management like goldman sachs by the way many of our clients are former goldman sachs private wealth clients which is really funny (laughs) oh wow i get to see all their holdings when they before they come over because they'll say hey rob what do you think about portfolio? So I know how they invest. And what they do is they push their own products. So Goldman has a wealth management business, but they often have another business unit called Goldman Sachs Asset Management. It's a sister company under Goldman. And they have these ETFs. So it's it's another layer of fees and it's a conflict. And I don't invest in any Goldman Sachs ETFs because not that great. And Goldman is known for having generally dreary performance, as is Morgan Stanley. By the way, they're also the leading tech M&A banker, so they're never critical. Apple was on the conviction buy list for Goldman Sachs. We said that made no sense last summer, and I shorted Apple. I wrote about that NX. The receipt, receipts were all there. And then Tesla, same thing. And Morgan Stanley, you know, they had a $400 price target on Tesla. We said, guys, interest rates are going up. That means it's harder to buy a car and finance it. And competition is coming from China. And, of course, Tesla's, in, you know, had a big severe bear market and ford and gm are outpacing tesla year to date by double digit percentage points right and they're getting so rid of their of ev stuff too it's just insane right there are a lot of conflicts in legacy you know legacy wealth management the old world and we're bringing them a new world the world needs modern wealth management no conflicts number one that's the basic standard but you got to do better than that modern investing thematic investing it's what i learned in venture capital you talked about some of my early investment deals, but the VCs, the best VCs in the world are thematic investors. What does that mean? They're not doing what legacy wealth managers do. They'll say, here's your large cap and here's your small cap value. Here's your mid cap bucket. They have a three by three matrix from small cap value to large cap growth and everything in between. And they put some ratios in these things, some fractions, right? That's not what a thematic investor, a thematic investor says, where's the world going? Mm. So VC might be betting on the rise of AI, the rise of digital assets. And we do the same thing. We say, look, uh, nuclear energy is coming back. We want to bet on that. Uh, we want to bet on demographic trends. The oldest, the oldest need more home care, elective health. Uh, cataracts are going up. How do I invest in a company that is providing cataract you know, services, uh, there's a housing shortage. So let's invest in home builders. Let's invest in companies that provide services to home builders. So we're, we're thematic. And then we have a quant overlay to look at different factors to make sure that we've got a portfolio that's well balanced. We're looking at factors like momentum and return on equity and yield. It's like designing a good diet, right? Use right. the factor. These are, the same, these are the same analytical tools that Citadel, We'll use two sigma. We'll use millennium. We'll use and legacy wealth managers don't use that. They don't even know that. And I'm a recovering quant as well. There's a profile of me and what I've written about on quant.stackexchange.com. You can see it there. I wrote there for two years. I was ranked a top one percent quant. Even now, I haven't written there in years. But in any case, it's uh, so we use that thematic approach with a quant overlay and then um, good business selection. That's inspired by like the Buffets and the Mungers. Well, what's a, what makes a great business? So try to find good businesses within those themes that we think will compound and do well or mispriced and have good trends behind their back and avoid things that are the opposite. Find monopolies. I uh, I was looking at the email with your, your management team and they said that you had an hour. Are you reaching towards the end of that time? It's... Yeah. Let me check real quick. Uh, because I do want to, I do want to allow uh, our uh, guests. Twelve ten. I can go to twelve ten. Oh, lovely! So that's fifteen more minutes. I want to 
Um, I want to turn it over to the public voice channel on Discord just in case there's anybody that wants to unmute and ask Rom a question uh, directly. I know he mentioned uh, AI. I see one of our AI researchers sitting in the uh, in the uh, chat. I don't know if Logri the Bard, if you can unmute if you want to ask anything or anyone else for that matter. I just want to make sure uh, we give that opportunity. Okay. It looks like uh, it looks like all the questions have been answered. Uh, a lot of people just sit on mute in the channel uh, because a lot of folks are at work right now. Um, but I'm super super glad that uh, they can jump in here and listen in. It's uh, it's it's so cool to hear your thoughts on everything. Uh, yeah. So Lumida Lumida is you've got the edge of being forward looking towards the emerging asset classes, crypto and AI, like having the specialty there for your high net worth individuals. They know that that piece is kind of taken care of. Yeah, we do and the work, we do the research. And you, yeah. you can spread out and do the rest of whatever they're doing as well. That's exactly. fantastic. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, fantastic. So really Say, oh, there's Logri the Bard. Go ahead, Logri. This won't be on AI, but um, I'd say over the time since I've been in crypto, I guess when I first got in here, there was this term, you know, uh, programmable money, and that Ethereum was trying to be programmable money. And Lumida, it sounds like, is basically programmable money. You can put your money with some intention into Lumida, and they will help you fulfill that intention and do all the trust, security, management, et cetera, of it. And... Um, in crypto, we see the many functions that Lumida is doing being broken down into numerous teams. So you're like, okay, Tokamak, if you want to go and push your money into a bunch of LP positions or you balance them or something like Gamma, if you want to sort of automate, you know, keeping your, your liquidity around a strike price and use V3 or something, or here's how we're going to break it out across lending, throw it into urine or something, right? Um, basically, and then we see more recently that the word is called intentions, as opposed to just sign transactions, or you're going to sign intent and then a you know, a cross chain relayer will execute whatever you want to do, a trade of, you know, buy $2 billion of the, that's fine, we'll execute it across every L2 known demand at every pool we can, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you do you see your firm, you know, getting involved in, in that capacity in, in blockchain, in oh, making, yeah, we, in, yeah, good. We are now. So first of all, we never custody anything, by the way. So in the public equities, Charles Schwab is our custodian. Uh, and then on crypto, we have a uh, non-custodial crypto wealth management service. So clients maintain their private keys and we can deploy them in strategies and they'll get a prompt on their MetaMask or their Coinbase wallet and they can approve transactions, which is super cool. I think we might be the first registered investment advisor to do that, by the way. And we do that through a technology platform called L1 Advisors. Uh, so yeah, look, all this belongs on chain, right? Uh, every investment you do belongs on chain. You know, that's not just public equities, but if you invest in a home or private equity hedge fund, that's the future. It, and everything you just said makes a ton of sense, right? If you uh, are interacting with a smart contract and you can express an intention for example uh, i want to have an intention of preserving liquidity that could alter how the smart contract invests or maybe the intention is uh growth versus uh generating income through staking or liquidity provision on uniswap right so I like that. It's a great, you know, uh, it's a, I, you know, infrastructure like index, index co-op, what they're building out. I mean, there's, there's a lot, a lot of that, need, that needs to be done. Um, you know, Securitize has is advancing the ball here too, and different tokenization um, firms as well, and and protocols. So there's still a lot more we have to go do. The thing that we're missing are all the legal frameworks, by the way. Like, how do you enforce? against a smart contract in the real world, especially when it comes to like a real world asset, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, I'm one, I heard this before that uh, actually one of the most promising things for blockchain is in TradFi, the legal rights of the asset are enforced separately from the asset. 
you have a judge, you know, have like a whole company that will put out mailers and let people vote and whatnot, but it's not actually part of the asset. It's external to the asset. Whereas in crypto, the rights and legal obligations of the asset are enshrined within the asset, right? In some sometimes immutable way. Um, and that, well, that's right. So when you have a real world asset, you have this thing that sits in both worlds, right? So imagine you've got a real world asset, which points to uh, a plot of land, you know, in Texas, and that's on chain. And, uh, you know, we can prove that you own that title on chain, but now someone squats on that in the real world. You need law enforcement, right? You need to enforce the law or someone disputes the transaction. And then you have to go to court in the real world, even though on chain it says like, oh, you have title to this thing, right? So that's where things get messy. Uh, if you if you, you said that we need legal clarity, if you had to pass one or two of your, your dream laws, if you had uh, briefly a few short things, what do you think are the areas of legal clarity that we should be focusing on those uh, as a crypto industry? I would, I would have a, an updated modern crowdfunding framework. So crowdfunding laws today, uh, they are not compatible with crypto and that is a major opportunity. So crowdfunding is a way to raise money for the public to invest in a project. That's what crowdfunding is. So remember like Kickstarter, you know, you, you go to Kickstarter, you want to fund a project. The difference there is you don't get any upside in the equity. You, you get a product if they deliver it, right? But imagine Kickstarter except for projects that are on chain. Now that's what happens, of course, with Coinlist.com. Uh, but Coinlist is only for offshore investors. And so if you're doing an onshore investment, it's complicated and you have all these issues with the SEC. So number one is update crowdfunding laws. Uh, part of the component of that is making creator economy on chain. So cultural relevance. So most of the American public doesn't really care about crypto, right? Just to be candid and frank and honest, why, why would they, right? But if you want the public to understand crypto and be a part of it, where crypto is in the background, like TCP IP, you need cultural relevance. You need those Bowie bonds. You need to get creators on chain because creators will bring crypto to the masses because they're influencers, they have followings. Mm. That's the Trojan horse. That's what you really need. Then the other area is tokenization of markets on chain. This is what Larry Fink has also been talking about. So, uh, and stable coins. Those four components would be comprehensive transformation of, yeah, crypto policy. So, how long do you think it's going to be until we have a act like a stock like Coinbase that emits a equivalent token on chain, right? Like a a legally binding here's your coin token. That's put onto a share. In the for US issuers, not anytime soon. Now there are protocols like synthetics, which I believe they've enabled like Tesla to be put on chain. And so they did. The, they they shuttered the program and didn't have enough volume. Uh, so yeah. just lack of interest. Right. So you know, in the United States that won't happen, but someone might uh put non US securities on chain. Uh yeah, it's just the yeah, it, the U.S. isn't geared up for for doing public securities offerings on chain today. So, so you think it's going to happen in Europe or something, and eventually there'd be you know, uh, well, the U.S. will come embarrassed by being fifteen years behind the times. We'll get around to it. Could be. We'll see. I, you need to see how the selection plays out. That it's a big driver, and then two, you got to see who's the Treasury Secretary. I'm not. And then we reassess and go from there. Yeah, we'll get stablecoin regulation. I think we'll get something there. Like, oh, the tide is turning there, right? The most popular cryptocurrency is the U.S. dollar. <laughs> in terms, it's of true. Of, well, in terms of volume, yeah, correct. So people are starting to realize that, and then they're saying, "Gee, Russia and China want to move off the dollar system." And the U.S. is a chance to advance U.S. dollar hegemony around the world on crypto. And 
wasn't on anyone's bingo card, but Tether is advancing, you know, US dollar, you know, hegemony through proliferation of that stable coin. And so is USDC. I think USDC will get a big win through stable coin regulation, by the way. Yeah. I think the regulators will favor USDC and uh, over Tether. I think something like that will happen. Yeah. Jer Jeremy Allaire, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's. Jeremy's just USCCA. Yeah, every time he every time he comes out with something big, it's always kind of a mind blow how big it really is. It, there's so many wins for USDC. It's it's encouraging. Yeah, they're spending a lot of time in DC. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, I think uh, I'll at least say on chain. The when I mean when you get to sexes, yeah, tether is uh, high highly liquid and highly traded. But when you get to on chain, most liquidity pools I see across DeFi have like over time very quietly been drifting away from tether over the years so i think i might have like one pool at the moment right tether exposure but if it was four years ago it'd been pretty much impossible to avoid comparing things against three curve and it'd be in there right right hey uh rom i want to interject just a second so you're talking to uh logary the bard long time ev maverick uh eat finance guy he has a website and i hope uh logary drops you a dm with it it's called tokenomics explained .com. uh oh, cool. very good resource uh logary's uh, he's a he's a think tank and a one-man brain um the guy uh he's i'll let him do his own intro but uh tokenomics explained .com. my there might be a i hate to use the word synergy there uh with what you do and what he does um but yeah you just met an awesome person hey, thank you appreciate that yeah I'll, I'll dm you a link to the website the latest thing i was writing was on dpin which is kind of um it's a hot topic it's one of the major trends in in uh DeFi at the moment that's sort of a resurgence of an old concept, but in, in the moment, it's really getting hyped because so much of the demand for compute is because of AI, right. because of the high margins of AWS. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I can say, if you look at uh, a P5 instance in AWS, it's running for like 90 an hour, which is about $12 a card, which is about a 250 to 300% margin on the underlying hardware. That's that's what AWS is making. If you want to rent a um, like an H one hundred card and do some some ML training on it, um, it is, it is extraordinarily lucrative for them, and it is not very accessible to academics or data scientists or anything else around the world. Right? I just went to the GTC conference in San Jose uh, the uh, the prior week. Oh, very cool! And, awesome. and wall to wall, like booth to booth. Whether or not your your offering was actually AI, every single company had some spin on how it's applicable to AI. So you'd be like, you know, Snowflake. Well, you're you're a database company basically, but it's like, no, bring AI to your data. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Every single thing, wall to wall, is that you would not even know that Nvidia sold gaming consumer grade cards from that booth, uh, from that conference. It had. It had you would have no idea it ever done crypto mining. You'd have no idea people use NVIDIA for gaming. It was wall to wall AI, uh, multiple huge conference rooms. You know, they sold out a, a stadium of 20,000 uh, seats to listen to some guy talk about AI for two hours. Like it is a huge swell at the moment. So I'd be curious to get your thoughts on how much that's going to flame out, how much of that is real, and where the investment opportunities in AI are, are right now, because, you know, NVIDIA is kind of high. The spending on data centers and GPUs is not going to stop for years. Mm. That's the one. Yeah. What is overhyped is the application layer that we consumers deal with and businesses deal with because AI is under delivering. One. Right. So you know, GPT. I saw a post yesterday isn't like coding anymore because you know there's fears of it creating code that might have been copied somewhere else, or depending on how you prompt it, et cetera. But the applications aren't quite delivering. You know, it does some things really well. It does summary. It does generation of text or images well. That's about it. Um, but oh, I, use, I use Copilot to help write code. It gets me 80% yeah, of the way there. Coding is a super use case for it. But even coding, though, it's, it's snippets. 
I can't say go build an application like this front end. Oh, no, no. You, you're like, do a function because I don't want to remember the stupid syntax, whatever exactly. library call does this in this language. I'm, you know, jump between it's five almost, languages. Yeah, it's almost like pair programming with like a 10x programmer kind of thing. But uh, yeah, that those use cases work, but broad-based application value isn't there versus what we saw in the dot-com era where we had the introduction of email, the web browser, you know, internet chat, you know, uh, instant messenger, so news groups, uh, uh, the existence of web pages, right? I mean, that, that, that innovation we haven't even matched yet. I know the adoption curves are high and all the rest, but the spending on GPU is not going to stop. The spending on data centers is not going to stop. Yeah, we own NVIDIA. We've been long NVIDIA, Meta, Google. Those are our favorites in Mag Seven, but we you know we have like forty to fifty positions. We have other semiconductors too, so you know it's a good portfolio of that. But we, our semiconductors are all indexed and like levered to GPU. We don't want to own semiconductors that are cyclical. We don't think GPU. Is, it's a ten-year trend, and all well, these model, models are only getting bigger, right? So like ChatGPT three had what one point five billion parameters or something in it. And the next gen is probably going to be 10x that. So you get to a point here where the model is so big it can't fit inside the consumer memory card, right? You're going to need more than 80 gigs of RAM just to hold video RAM, just to hold the thing right. and process on it. So NVIDIA's so, new Blackwell system, um, their future roadmap will support a trillion dollar parameter, a trillion parameter model. So it's going to need a lot of training data. The point is like all these big tech companies are in an arms race to win the consumer app, the enterprise app, and the sovereign AI app. I'm simplifying it, but those are three different customer segments, oh, yeah. right? So they have to keep upgrading to ensure they can minimize latency because latency improves satisfaction. Remember, Google kept investing in that technology because they saw greater um, search engagement, for instance. Uh, so yeah, this is a this arms race is not going to stop anytime soon. The prize is too big, and the losers in the arm race are going to see their market caps slashed. That's it. And these big tech companies have billions in free cash flow. So Nvidia is making a fortune here, but the big tech companies can afford it, and the sovereigns can afford it. Defense budgets are going to be spent on semiconductors. Think about it that way, right? Mm. Every sovereign is going to need their own data center, not just one data center, because they're going to have uh, disaster recovery. And they're going to want it on-prem, not in the cloud necessarily, not in Amazon. They don't necessarily trust the United States. So the spending on GPUs, we invested in CoreWeave last October of this past year. We got it in a $3 billion valuation. It's already up to $7 billion valuation, according to... Uh, Bloomberg. Hey, so, on the uh, on the crypto end of that, we have uh, various compute brokers, and then we have various apps that are plugging in on those compute brokers. You can be like, "Well, I'm going to submit a generic task, and it's going to get dispatched down to some provider that and they're going to go and run some." It's like remote execution, right? Um, yeah, no, but I like then that. you have like that in this case, and you're right. We're going to have GPUs on the edge. We're going to have AI laptops coming. New new types of devices with. GPUs and hardware-based memory. So we're gonna have a new laptop cycle, but the applications have to match to drive the demand. The applications aren't there yet. We need to rethink how the operating system is designed. We need to rethink the browser, right? Like imagine yeah. AI that can follow you across your apps, know your context, take instructions. That's step one. And then step two is the apps go away. Why do you need the apps? <laughs> Just data. Documents. No, it's, it's it's intention, right? If, right? if you can have your intention, then all the web form is doing is satisfying your intention in a kind of clunky way. But if we actually know your intention, we can just give you what you want, right? Exactly. Um, what do you need the web form for? Exactly. I've got to run for something now. This is a lot of fun, though. Really enjoyed the conversation. Rom, so. it's a pleasure to have you. Hopefully, we can get you back maybe twice a year just to do a little check in with you. Would you be open yeah, to that? That'd be great. Happy to do it. Oh, Happy man. Do it. Love to have you. Uh, Ram Alawalia, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and most importantly, your week. And we will catch you on the next one. Sure. Thank you. Happy Easter. Take care now. Happy Easter. Bye. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ram, for uh, joining. Let me get my overlay fixed here. There we go. You bet.
banger huh that was awesome and rom i sent you a friend request i still see you on the discord uh we'd love to have awesome. you come back anytime buddy take care cool, man. thank you bud take care and have a good one bye-bye bye-bye all right so we're gonna just jump right in um this was a uh, one hell of a show and uh we're just uh I'm just glad we were able to get that connection going. Our weekly haiku, courtesy of JS Tears, uh, jailed FTX, bro. It's six having in a row, raise and fall below. Very good weekly haiku by JS Tears. How does he do it? How does he do it? Let me end my uh, Zoom call here. Okay, and uh, it's clam choda time, right? You take my energy in our shit post of the week. I skipped all this stuff earlier because I really wanted to get right in uh, with Ramo. I hope you guys uh, will forgive me. Our shit post of the week goes to Tricky Troll. Is you don't have enough points, the new you don't have enough ETH? Question mark. <laughs> No kidding. Moving on down the list, user AAQY explains why they aren't going, uh, they aren't voting to increase the gas limit. AAQY is a duder number eight. Hey guys, as a Genesis solo validator, wow, I would like to share with you the reasons why I oppose the increase in block size at the present time. Number one, it's pointless. We're not going to attract new users or new use cases by simply reducing fees for a very limited time. No one is going to consider using Ethereum because a transaction costs $4 instead of $5. I understand it is annoying to hear the same complaints over high fees over and over again, but those complaints are not going to be tamed with a fee reduction that would anyway last very little as an example the last hard fork has indeed reduced fees on l1 more or less on the same scale that a block increase would do but almost no one noticed number two it is not sufficiently tested and could be dangerous especially for small validators when reasons for increasing size are cited reference is usually made to disk size but other more important factors for small operations are bandwidth, data rate limits, computational capacity, or RAM installed. Increasing the block size increases resources and could expose small validators to spam attacks that cause them to lose their turn and thus allow an attacker to steal rewards or MEV from them. Number three. It could hurt L2 scaling plans. The last hard fork allowed Ethereum L2s to start competing with more centralized alternative L1s. However, even with three blobs per block, the trans uh, transactions per second we are seeing are very low with respect to, for example, Solana, whose transactions per second are close to 1,000. An increase in the number of blobs can be very significant to achieve equivalent capacity. This improvement, in contrast to a limited increase in block size, can indeed attract new users, developers, and use cases, since the chosen L2 could offer the same TPS as L1 alternatives but with the added security provided by the Ethereum network, as well as compatibility with existing tools and ease of development. In short, the space we would lose by increasing the block size in a rush might be needed in the future to increase blob capacity. Therefore, he continues, or she, I think this is not the right time to increase the block size. I think we should wait until Ethereum L2s have reached a point where they can compete with alternative L1s in terms of capacity and the cases where complex blocks can cause small validators to miss blocks have been thoroughly tested and eliminated. Great job, AAQI. User Web of Trust is grateful for this amazing community. I recently read Polinia's latest blog. Uh, that is, Polinia is actually liberosist on Reddit, uh, by the way, which reminded me of how grateful I am to be a part of this group. X is nothing but a shit show. Uh, Farcaster looks promising, but the conversation is fragmented. The only place that where the comment to quality ratio is high is here with a wholesome bunch of strangers discussing the whole ecosystem and offering help without prejudice. It's a rare find in the current market, especially now that meme mania seems to be leading the charge. Even beyond this group, some fellow members have offered their guidance and support. Minimal gravitas, 
my dude, if it weren't for your kind words, I would have left the Dow in 2022. Do you know? A fellow member even offered me their nook, and it is up and running. Every time I look at it, I forget the gloom I see elsewhere. It gives me hope. This motivation to run a node, even if it's non-staking, was inspired by Nixo's tweet. Not directly, but Logri has taught me valuable lessons through this well-explained his well-explained comments whether on vacation or gone camping no worries tricky got you covered with the dudes when you're back benito and hanny have written extensively on different topics from dow to lst to client diversity and the list goes on all that without an expectation of any financial return sometimes we take things for granted or we are unaware of impact of our action but not today Today, I want to show my gratitude and thank you all for contributing to this forum. Even if I have nothing to say, I read the daily and learn something from it, and I am grateful for that. That is user web of trust. That is so awesome. Thanks for writing that. Duder number 27. <laughs> he says, he, they say that they uh, don't really contribute much, but they got, they've been on the dudes list 27 times. Um, that's a lot of character right there. Good on you. User PA7X1 does some L2 education and FUD busting. L2beat.com does an amazing job at explaining the trade-offs in detail. L2s are definitely not Web2 technology. In fact, it's so novel that they are still being built, which is why they have some amount of training wheels and safety guards at the moment. The first thing to observe is that you can give up decentralization for an L2 as long as some protections are guaranteed to the user programmatically. It's okay for a roll-up operator to run the roll-up themselves. It may even be permissioned. It may even be censored. And that's okay, as long as you can always escape hatch with your assets to the layer one. And the analogy I would use here is that this is the same exact thing that happens with private business businesses. A restaurant doesn't have to serve you. They may reserve the right to not have you as a customer sometimes for trivialities like dress code. A web forum may ban you, and that's fine because you can go anywhere else. If you're unhappy with the roll-up, you get your stuff and go somewhere else. Your fundamental rights are preserved in the public space. The L1 is the public space, and the L1 is permissionless and censorship resistant. So you can be sure there will be somewhere else to go. And then they go on with an example from Arbitrum. Um, let's see, I'm going to finish up. If even if Arbitrum went for the ultimate censorship, turning off their roll-up, you would be able to use the L1 and the escape hatch. Bitcoin maxis have been parroting a never-ending stream of FUD arguments for years, systematically being proven wrong. And when that happens, instead of recognizing their mistake, they move to new FUD arguments. Facts be damned. I would recommend updating your Bayesian priors Bayesian priors uh, taking their track record into account. PA 7X1. Moving on down, user OK Dragonfruit 1929 lists a few ways which may result in failure for Ethereum. I'm dealing with internalizing the hate towards Ethereum, but I'm also trying to prevent myself by being blinded by my own bi bias. One trap that I people often fall into is refusing to acknowledge any scenario where their beliefs, convictions, or ideals could ever be wrong. As a result, I'm compiling a list of things which would indicate to me that I was wrong about Ethereum, that Ethereum was a failed experiment doomed due to irreparable flaws. Of the four listed here, any one of the first three coming true, I think, would be enough for me to concede the death of ETH. Number one, Unresolvable security vulnerabilities causing financial losses, undermining trust in Ethereum's security model. This could include supermajority bugs causing a chain split or repeated successful attacks against the network. Number two, if Ethereum's development or governance becomes heavily centralized, contradicting its ethos of decentralization. Number three, a breakdown in the Ethereum community, whether due to internal conflicts, disillusionment with the project's direction, or a mass migration to other projects, could severely impact the development and support 
of the platform. Number four, to a lesser extent, I would also concede that regulatory actions against Ethereum specifically or decentralized platforms in general could be a huge blow to Ethereum's vision as the settlement layer for the world's finance and uninterruptible Web3. I say this would prove Ethereum's failure in my mind to a lesser extent than the other scenarios I listed here because... Even if the governments of the world put aside their differences to agree to attack Ethereum or restrict it, Ethereum would never truly die. It would simply go underground. It would be vastly less profitable, but it would not disappear entirely. For myself, and hopefully some of you here who are deeply invested in, in Ethereum's success, these scenarios would likely need to be demo demonstrable, systemic, and irreparable to convince us that Ethereum was a failed experiment. That is user OK Dragon Fruit 1929 with a bit of levity about the possibilities of failure. Duder number 48. Wow, he's up there on the list. Um, and as always, if anybody wants to unmute and join in, you can. User Here I Am Alive shares Vitalik's comments on getting Ethereum ready for real world adoption. What do you think about Vitalik's what do you think about Vitalik's five year time frame for Ethereum to prove it's ready for mainstream real world adoption? And the list goes to the Defiant article. And uh Here I Am Alive uh, quotes this article. Despite the CC subreddit, cryptocurrency subreddit pushing a negative narrative, it seems like Vitalik is actually bullish. Quote, I expect Ethereum to be a very leading player in helping to make stablecoin accessible to people in a way that is actually open, actually is decentralized, and actually doesn't require trusting fragile third parties. He goes on. Also improvements. Okay, unquote. This is here I am alive talking again. Also, improvements to be able to run a node, not sure of validators, but probably, without the need for a lot of storage space. ZK Snarks would help us move from our staking rigs to just a phone or a very light processing on a computer. Quoting the article again, with Verkle Trees as a node, you would not have to store the state locally. And with EIP 4444 history expiry, you would not have to store most of the history locally, Buterin said. The amount of data that you would need to run a node would decrease from multiple terabytes to being able to run a node in RAM. Holy smokes. He goes on. In the long term, running a node will feel like a few very simple computations that will be very easy to do as a background process on any computer, maybe even a phone, even inside a browser, Buterin said. There's a pre-existing technology roadmap to get to that point. Thank you for that submission. Here I am live sharing Vitalik's comments. User Straw Dar explains. Oh, I didn't. Did I go to here? I am a live score. I, I always I always like to see the score. Uh, here I am alive sitting at Duder number seven. Very good. Uh, Straw Dar explains why ETH staking is in 32 ETH chunks. With the IP7251 Max EB coming, I was curious why the Beacon Chain did not launch this way in the first place. It has an interesting backstory. From the EIP itself, quote, the limit on the max effective balance is technical debt from the original sharding design in which subcommittees, not the attesting committee, but the committee calculated in is aggregator, needed to be majority honest. As a result, keeping the weights of subcommittee members approximately equal, reduce the risk of a single large validator containing too much influence. Under the current design, these subcommittees are only used for attestation aggregation and thus only have a one of n, uh, one per n honesty assumption. I hope I read that right. Stradar. Stradar is a user number six. Thank you so much for that. Astafari12, I always feel like Astafari12 is like a Jamaican name. Astafari12 questions the magnitude of the benefits, uh, benefit of increasing maximum validator balances while user Interweaver, freaking legend, delivers the answer. Astafari is quoting, Max EB is now planned for the next hard fork. This will remove the 32 ETH max limit for validators, greatly reducing bandwidth consumption for stakers. Uh, this is a quote from Eric 
dot eth that would be eric connor's uh on twitter and the link is at daily dudes will max eb uh, astafari 12 continues with a question will max eb really reduce bandwidth greatly keyword greatly only if the whales with thousands of validators actually consolidate to big validators instead of many small ones something that is yet to be seen you could argue that they don't want to have 3200 ETH validators as the impact of a bug would be 100x bigger. It would lower Ethereum protocol risk though, so it should be in their best interest. Hmm, interesting. It seems unlikely to me that we will go lower the number of validators by 50 to 75%, which is what I would consider greatly reducing consumption. More likely, we will drop by some 10 to 30%. So, not really making a big difference in terms of bandwidth. User Interweaver uh, responds, this is almost certainly referring to attestation subnets. For each validator, a solo staker has up to 64. They have to su sub subscribe to a new attestation subnet with all the gossip and increased traffic that causes. If that solo staker con consolidates their validators under max EB, they could go back down to a single attestation subnet, reducing bandwidth usage significantly. Astafari12 is... Uh, I'm not in old Reddit. Let me get in old Reddit real quick. Link the new Reddit there, A word. Uh, let's get this figured out. Deuter number 17. Very good. And Interweaver is a Deuter number four, five. Good stuff. Frank the Tank, F R E N K the Tank, shares the great combo of Paul Brody and the EEA. On my LinkedIn feed, I saw that Paul Brody just got appointed as chairman of the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. Curious as to what his plans are to speed up enterprise adoption. And there's a link to his um, LinkedIn. And he, he did uh, tag user Paul Brody in, but uh, Paul did not respond. I think Paul did respond in a daily somewhere else. Um, uh, Toby, Toby actually does the ping. Toby says, although to be honest, everything I've read and heard from him was about blockchain for enterprise and enterprise adoption. He wrote a whole book on that topic. So I think he'll bring parts of what he's doing at EY to the e EEA. God, do you guys remember the back in the day when like we would get like a daily notification that some company had joined the EEA and then like the price would go up a dollar or two and then it would jump five dollars, you know, and dump again. It's just, it's so fun. Uh, and then to like fast forward and now Paul's like the president of that. Uh, what a, what a freaking gem. Okay. User Denton with three N's at the end of his name because one wasn't enough is grateful for this community. I just wanted to amplify user web of trust post from two days ago. What an awesome community this is. I'm a relatively late comer to the community. Uh, Denton is a duder number four. Thank you all for consistently sharing your knowledge with internet and ons like me. I've learned, I've learned more from this sub than any other place on the internet. I literally got a job offer because I dove into MEV because of the Daily Dutes post about it consistently throughout the past few years. I didn't take the offer in the end. Your selfless sharing has consequences and my career trajectory is one of them. Other, <laughs> other than that, this year has been transformative me for uh, for transformative for me career wise. I got back in the crypto industry after a stint in fintech. And personally, as an artist, I did my first solo exhibition and going to ETH Denver for the first time and meeting user JT Nickel and other folks was the most wholesome experience I've had in a long time. I want to tell you about this. Okay. I remember this. I just showed up to uh, East Denver and I was going, I just was going to the counter to get like my badge and I got my badge, my lanyard. And then this user goes, JT, is that you? And I go, yes, it is. And he's like, I could recognize, I recognized your voice. And then, and then it just, we, we actually walked around together for a while. It was really, really, really cool. So yeah, shout out to you, Denton. I'm glad that you found this post, uh, a word, 
Uh, this is neat. I work on, he goes on, I work on consumer side of crypto, specifically in games. That's right. He's a game guy. And 99% of the people are talking about casino degen active crypt aspect of crypto. I think they are firmly in the camp of quote, it's just how it is. And perfectly captures what Polinia's sentiment that, uh, that sentiment of Polinia's. Quote, this evil in crypto is a banal and normalized. This has become the identity of crypto. Sure, some useful stuff, but mostly just infested with scams and absolute degeneracy, unquote. He goes on, despite the misaligned incentives, greed, and grift in the space, I don't see any other system that can even attempt to fix the problems we face at scale. I don't know what the answer is, but I believe it starts with places like ETH Finance that can influence the culture of the ecosystem. And... I also finally got my EVM today. Yay. Shout out to you, Denton. Amazing. User data always investigates client diversity. It's not a topic I look at much, nor one that I plan to spend much more time on, but I spend I spent my morning trying to fill in some knowledge gaps about execution layers and clients this morning. Most uh, execution layer clients, sorry, altogether. Most of you guys rely on supermajority.info, but obviously there are some unknowns since not all proposer sets have publicly stated their client usage, such as Binance, Kraken, OKX, Bitcoin, Swiss, etc. The idea is that even though most of the blocks are built through PBS, uh, every proposer still has a small share of locally built blocks. Minimum bid reversions, network latency, delaying payloads from relays, local blocks being more valuable than PBS if there isn't much MEV during the block, etc. And for those subsets of blocks, we can look at the extra data encoded on chain to tag what client proposers are using. Part of the issue with this methodology is that Beisu and Aragon don't actually embed extra data. So the field is blank. And at the same time, there are some MEV builders who try to stay anonymous and don't embed data. So we can only cleanly tag Geth and neither mind. And then we need to check versus off-chain MEV data to see if the empty data blocks are from anonymous MEV builders or from one of Besu or Aragon. Uh, on top of that, there's occasionally been MEV builders using the neither mind tag that briefly crop up. I think this is just from misconfigurations because they go away pretty quick, but it adds a bit of noise to the data. Basically, the methodology is a bit of a mess. A quick summary. Binance is 100% guess. Kraken seems to use multiple execution clients, but tagging what share is, is kind of hard. It could be one of three, one of three, or one of three, or maybe half, or one quarter neither mind, or one quarter basically or Aragon. Okay, X is majority guess. They seem to use a bit of nether mind and maybe a little bit of Basu Aragon, but the counts are really low. Okay, X is a pretty reliable proposer, so they don't have many local blocks. Bitcoin Swiss, 100% guess. The data is here for anyone that wants to take a peek. And that is from Data Always. Data Always is, let me close out a couple tabs here. Data always is a duder number four. Thank you for your contribution. User not hyphen not going to make it. <laughs> User not not going to make it. Rounds up all of the many pieces of ETF news from the day. Wow, there's a bunch of links in here. CFTC refers to ETH as a commodity again in their KU coin complaint on the same day court side with SEC on the staking issue in Coinbase case. Meanwhile, Fidelity files S1. That's right. Fidelity filed their S1 form for spot Ethereum ETF with staking included. Within 24 hours, Larry Fink says on Fox News that if ETH were designated as a security, he quotes, that wouldn't be delir deleterious, deleterious to the approval of an ETF. Yeah, he was like, yeah, and an ETF security that can also contain securities was his words. I remember that. Perhaps spot ETF, ETH is a commodity, CFTC regulated, but staked ETH as a security, which we SEC regulated. Prediction, staked ETH ETF approved before the spot ETH ETF. Wow, that's bold. That's bold, not, not going to make it. <laughs> 
It's a double negative. Uh, Duder number 21. Thank you so much. And finally, user Paul Brody is looking to catch up with ETH financiers like you this year. Where, he asked, where are people going to be the next few weeks? Is there some way to share where we will be? I'm headed to Bucharest. Well, this guy, he lives in freaking a plane, I swear. Bucharest, March 30th and 31st. London, April 16th to the 18th for the EY Blockchain Summit. Dubai in April. Brussels in July. And New York in September uh, to October 2nd. And Bangkok, November 11 to the 16th. Who am I going to see where? That is so cool. So he he posted in the daily looking for Mavericks to meet up. Looks like Denton is going to meet him. Nixo, E2353, Harag, EVM Lion, Luki Mons, Alexis Kef, the Dow Baco, the A word. Uh, the, the A word says Brody's Brody Assemble. <laughs> Oh, man, this is fun. Uh, I'm so glad uh, you dropped in the daily Mr. Paul Brody. And, uh, yeah, we've got the conference stuff coming up. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff on the on the calendar on ETH Finance. Well, that's it for today. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the show. As always, it's phenomenal to, to see everybody show up. This was probably our largest call to date. Uh, we got several guests coming up. April 5th, Don Gosen of Nevermind. Uh, April 12th, Paul's coming back. And April 19th, Swagdomus Prime of Scroll. If you know anybody that wants a piece of this action, send them my way. All right, so check us out after the show. Hopefully later on today or tomorrow, I'll get uh, this podcast up on Pods.media, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and just search for EV Mavericks. If you're not already subscribed, stick around after the live stream because we continue the party in the hotel lobby on Discord for a bonus hour of popcorn. It's a fun place to let loose when the parents aren't watching on YouTube. Hi, Mom. On behalf of ETH Finance and the EV Mavericks Dow, my name is JT. Cheers and big hugs from Kansas 